Welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 220, featuring a retrospective that's long, long overdue for a true computer role-playing game masterpiece, namely Wizardry 8. Now, this game was released in 2001, and it was designed uh, primarily uh, by Brenda Braithwaite, future wife of John Romero, architect of Doom, but also, of course, a great game developer and designer in her own right, as this game clearly shows. Anyway, this is a, a really amazing and sophisticated game. We've got a lot to cover. So, uh, without further ado, here is Wizardry 8. Before the beginning, the Cosmic Lords crafted three artifacts. A Triforce, if you will. First was the Astral Domine, infused with the power of life itself. Next, the Chaos Moleri, source of all change. Last was the Destiny Dominus, containing all knowledge. The Lords created the very first world using these artifacts, Planet Dominus, and placed it next to the Cosmic Circle. When the work of creation was finished, the Lords hid the items using the Cosmic Forge, and so their secrets remained hidden for a time. Then the unthinkable happened. <gasps> the cosmic forge was stolen. The magic concealing the three items failed. News of the artifacts spread throughout the countless worlds. With it spread an even more unbelievable rumor. Whoever obtains all three will gain the powers of the Cosmic Lord. The Astral Domine was first of the three to be found, hidden on a remote world. Hey, it's rock steady. It was the of a bitter war between the militant Umpane, the devious Trang, and the Dark Savant. In the end, the Dark Savant gained the Astral Domine. Within it, he found a map pointing to Dominus. The Chaos Moleri was discovered half a galaxy away. The Mook found the device when it tore through a nearby moon with unbelievable force. When the Mook recovered the object, they too discovered a map. The Destiny Dominus collected dust in a remote monastery on Dominus for uncounted years. Its true powers concealed with magic writ by the Forge. But the Destiny Dominus is no longer there. A madman named Martin stole it, they say. And Martin has vanished. A new age is about to begin. A new page will be written in the Book of Fate. It is the time of the ascension and the dawning of a new destiny. Who will prove worthy? Who will become cosmic lords themselves? Who? Me, me, me. Man, who wouldn't want to become a cosmic lord? That's my kind of game. All right, let's get this party started. And I did mean that literally. You've got to create a full six characters. Now, you can if you played the seventh game. You can just import those characters. Fortunately, I haven't done that. It also has some pre-made characters you can choose from, but what's the fun in that? Come on, create your own party. I'll tell you one thing, man, you've got a shit ton of options here. <laughs> Look at all of that. And Gadgeteer, Alchemist, Bishop, Psionic, a lot of stuff you don't normally see. Well, there's a lot of Asian-influenced uh, classes there. Samurai and ninjas and monks. It's a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat. You can really get into... Uh, I actually like all these options because it gives you a lot of replay value. If you have a gadgeteer and a bar in the party, that's going to make a huge difference in the way you play the game. I mean, these classes aren't just, you know, they, they <laughs> combine a couple other ones and call it a class. Uh, definitely not. Uh, you get a lot of variety here. You really need to pay attention to the descriptions and try to figure out what they're good at. Uh, that's going to have a big uh, factor on how you play the game. Let's look in here at the samurai. So you can see they're fearless. They have a lightning strike. They're good with the sword, good with close combat. Uh, then we have the ninja. 
and they're very good at throwing things like I guess a shurikens maybe or rocks <laughs> a darts maybe whatever you find to throw also good with hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, the Valkyrie what's cool about them is they have to be female and they're good with pole arms <laughs> like uh, weapons with a long shaft uh, I'm not gonna read too much into that also have a bunch of different races got the usual stuff hobbits and elves but also some unusual races like Dracon combination dragon human can breathe acid that sounds pretty cool uh, you got a cat person dog person uh, something called a mook it's kind of like a, a Wookiee <laughs> just lots of options okay so then you got your points to put into your stats and from what I was reading you don't want to be too spread out spread yourself too thin it's better to try to get a couple of stats up to 100 as soon as possible then you get some special perks uh, same thing with skills so don't try to make a jack of all trades if you can help it go ahead pump up that pole arm now it's a uh, light blue that means that's my class specialty so I get a little extra bonus for pumping that one up go ahead and do that close combat pretty self-explanatory you have artifact mythology communication over there communications your NPC interaction artifacts how well you're able to identify things you find and then the mythology will give you information about the monsters it's pretty important actually okay then you pick your portrait then you can pick a voice you got it I'm ready for anything and I mean anything <laughs> I love it <laughs> so you don't really need full voice acting in a game just a little bit of flavor uh, voice text is fine uh, but just don't uh, whip through this piece too fast you don't want to have the same voice on more than one character <laughs> that'll get kind of irritating so you know, take a little time with this okay go ahead and create another character here let's make this one ninja who makes a good nin ninja fairy <laughs> no make kind of a I like the idea of this ninja thundercat here fell purr looking at this stuff there says it'll be good at ninjas Okay, I need to pump up my speed, my senses. Uh, looks like maybe dexterity there. So I guess just, you can kind of go with uh, these templates a little bit, see what they recommend. And then just sort of pump those stats up. I haven't played these kind of uh, professions before, so <laughs> it'll be kind of interesting. All right, so I'm going to have to go through this uh, four more times. Uh, so I think what I'll do is just skip ahead here so you can actually see the game. All right, so we've crash landed. This unfortunate crash was most unexpected. Yet, opportunity often follows misfortune. We must be prepared to grasp it when it arrives. I love how they start you off staring at a treasure chest. <laughs> it's all about the loot. <laughs> you can look here at my characters. Kind of an interesting mix. You see, this is a uh, none of this stuff should be that unusual. Uh, the armor class works a little differently. Tell you more about that in a second. Now these are the the way I've got the party organized. Present. You can get in this game. You can be attacked from the sides, from the back. You get surrounded quite often. You can try to keep your back up against a wall or preferably in a corner to prevent that. But you definitely want to put some thought into where you place your party members. That's gonna you have to think about whether they have uh, spears or pole arms that can reach across. If they have ranged weapons, that uh, mage is the weakest, so I tried to... I mean, the bishop is the weakest guy I've got, so I tried to put him in the most protected space. Okay, just seeing if I've got any items I can use. See, each uh, character has a primary weapon and a secondary weapon. Uh, Seems like the best thing to do is to have a ranged and a, a melee weapon, and the computer will automatically switch it for you. So ideally, you'll have a ranged weapon in everybody's uh, arsenal. Because a lot of the times, enemies will spot them from pretty far off and you get a couple hits in before they close. It's quite nice. Also, you want to spread out these potions. Uh, once we get into battle, uh, you can still access these party items, but you have to waste a turn to do it. If you have it in your inventory already, you can just use it instantly or... Uh, when it's your turn, save a little time. <laughs> Believe me, right, these, these initial battles, uh, it's just amazing how quickly you can die. So <laughs> you want to do a little prep first. 
really happy I got a bard in this party. First uh, party I created, I made the mistake of not including the bard. And uh, it's kind of a mistake because they've got a lot of special items that only they can use and some very powerful stuff. They really did a good job with the bard. All right, here's my first battle. <laughs> and it's crabs. <laughs> oh, I got to keep these guys off me. Now, see those little triangles pointing at the monsters? That's showing me... It's all color-coded, right? And that's the... Uh, who in the party is attacking that crab? I've got it in continuous mode, so it's pretty much just automatic at this point. The yeah, combat is probably the most interesting aspect of this game. As you can see, a lot of this is automated, but I can uh, put a spell in there. It's kind of a queue system. So if I'm quick enough, I can insert a spell, and that'll cast when it's my spellcaster's turns. You can use items, access the inventory, and so on. Now, they also have the option of phased combat, which I guess is a little bit more traditional, but I actually really enjoyed the continuous combat, so I just uh, kept playing with that. I guess if you have a really tough battle, you could switch to the phased if you prefer, but I think the, the continuous combat gives you enough flexibility. kind of keeps you on your toes. All right, so before I go inside that temple, I'll take a look around outside. You can see the, it's like the tail fin of my spacecraft. Looks like a lot like a stealth bomber. <laughs> sure. You know, playing this game, I was uh, just really, really reminded of Jay Barnson's uh, Frayed Knights game. I didn't, you know, I hadn't, I didn't ever, I didn't uh, play this Wizardry 8 while it was new. It was always overpriced, in my opinion. You know, it, it came out as something like $60, $70, and it just never dropped in price. And You know, you think enough years go by, eventually you'll be able to get it for a bargain, but pretty much uh, jumped right into collectible status right after that. So never been able to acquire a copy of this. I see something. At least not a physical copy. Of course, it is on GOG and Steam. So I activated the search mode, and... You'll actually find quite a few items that way. I kind of like just to leave it on all the time, but it does... I don't think you regenerate your fatigue, your stamina as well, if you do that. All right, here comes a lot of crabs. Now, I've died a couple of times in this battle here, so I had to reload. So, this game is definitely... <laughs> definitely is not a hand-holding game at all, so... You know, if you are adverse to having to reload a battle a few times, I don't even bother with <laughs> don't even bother with this game. Okay, I went ahead and tried to use my bard's instrument there. It's supposed to put some of them to sleep. Now you see how they're surrounding me. Keep your eye on that at that uh, little party configuration down there in the lower right corner. You can see which way my individual party members are facing. That give you an idea of uh, how you should arrange your characters. If uh, some of your vulnerable characters are getting hit too much, you might want to move them around. All right, there goes that. Looks like I got a couple to go asleep, take them out of the battle. Now everybody's focused on the one that's not asleep. <laughs> that's quite nice. I mean, actually, that uh, yeah, that's the first time I used the Bard's instrument, and it man, did it make a difference. First time I tried this battle, I lost the two party members. Unfortunately, don't have enough uh, healing spells to go around, so I'm going to have to start dipping into my potions. I can't get this crab exterminated! I love the music, the music as well. The version I've got includes the soundtrack, which is quite nice. Some of my other party members will eventually gain some spells. You know, the leveling system's interesting, too. I'll try to tell you more about that as we go, but sort of a combination of... Uh, you level up the skills as you use them, and then when you level up, you also get more points you can distribute. So, pretty flexible system. All right, got me a cherry bomb. You probably want to save this. These uh, AOE weapons, area of effect weapons, come in very handy. Eventually, I'll start get it, getting attacked by large groups, and man, those uh, really make a difference. Got a sling there. That counts as a thrown weapon, so I might consider giving that to my ninja. I don't know yet. Another potion. So if it's in red, uh, that means uh, the profession can't use it. So I need to try to see. Uh, so the armor, I was telling you about the armor. 
So instead of having, uh, you know, you get a helmet, you put gloves on, and it adds up, you know, to build your AC, it actually uses an average system, and it's based on the, uh, I guess, how critical that body part is. So if you have a really good, uh, let's say, breastplate, that's going to do more for you than a really good helmet. Prepared. See how some of those items, uh, I don't even have gloves, the pants, the boots, the tunic. So you want to think about that when you're buying equipment. You know, just because a, you know, a set of gloves might have a plus eight AC, but you won't actually see that. <laughs> I guess your hands aren't as important as your chest. Which makes a certain amount of sense. I'm going to tweak my party layout here, and then uh, let's go and explore, explore that temple. The development of this game is a pretty interesting story, too. Uh, David Bradley, of course, did the 6th and 7th games, part of a trilogy starting with Bane of the Cosmic Forge. Uh, but this one, uh, David wasn't part of this. Instead, it was designed by Brenda Bratwaith, known uh, nowadays, of course, as Brenda Romero. She married John Romero. <laughs> creator of, uh, of Doom, and I think she really just did an amazing job with this. I love the atmosphere here. kind of reminds me of those uh, later Might and Magic games, but a lot more technical, a lot more sophisticated, tactically speaking. I got a bunch of green slimes here. What would a role-playing game be without slime? I mean, that's right up. Slimes are right up there with rats. You don't have them in your game. I mean, what the hell are you thinking? At least these slimes don't rot my weapons. Pretty easy battles here at the start of the temple, but even such, it doesn't take uh, very many hits for my characters to die. Now, if a character dies, it's not the end of the game. Eventually, I'll be able to find some resurrection salts, I think they call them, or resurrection powder. You can res the character that way, but if you have to buy those, they're about a thousand gold a pop, maybe more, so it's probably better just to reload, <laughs> unless you're really hardcore. I did uh, lose a character one time and just wanted to see if I could just make it through this with only five, <laughs> and quickly decided not to reload. Okay, just uh, figuring out who needs the rocks. So you see you put your ammo over there in that slot. If you got a two-hander, it won't let you put a shield in there or you know another weapon you can dual wield apparently some people don't like the dual wielding in this game I don't really know why it seems to work out fine for me oh, got me another slime this battle seemed to be getting easier and easier but then again you never know what's right around the next corner you'll notice over there on the lower left is the sort of radar. If you follow the dots on there, it'll show you the enemies and allies, as well as if there's an item that you can pick up. So I can't get inside there yet. Got me some arrows. <laughs> I always love the, you know, trying to figure out how do these nice little caches of weapons get there. And I guess you... The monks in this monastery just thought it'd be a good idea to have some arrows here and there stashed away. Now it's a little dark. I don't have a character that has the light spell. So that probably wasn't the best planning on my part. But if you have a mage or several different classes uh, can actually cast this light spell. I think that might actually help you with your searching. Not for sure about that, but it sounds reasonable. All right, put these bats to sleep with my trusty bard's musical instrument. Already really, really liking this bard. <laughs> okay, what's going on? So I got some enemies that are off screen. See up there at the top, see those numbers, one, zero, zero? Okay. Uh, the one is how many, the next number is uh, how many are in range, or uh, the next number is how many are active, I'm sorry. And then the last number there is how many are in range. And so this guy's now in range. I go ahead and run. You're not frozen in place during battle, but you can't just move at any time. You have to activate the walk or run icon down there, and then it'll add that to the queue. You can move your party around. It actually comes in very handy. Again, if you don't, if you want to avoid getting surrounded, you can use that to try to find a nice corner to fight in. 
So it seems like this new party's working out okay. I'm a little bit concerned. It seems a little bit oh, melee no. heavy to me at this point. <laughs> I really would like to have a dedicated mage. Because there's a lot of uh, really cool spells that you can cast that pretty much target every critter in sight. Uh, you also want to focus on, oh, look there. Uh, with your magicals, when you're picking spells, uh, the paralyzed type things and the blind. You know, anything that can disable an opponent, those will be very, very handy in this game. A lot more useful than they would be in a lot of other games, so you know, don't overlook those. Take a look at the handy map. You could put notes on the map, of course. Doesn't uh, label anything for you. A little bit of a drag there, but you just had to remember to do it here. yourself. I got the search turned on, so she's trying to find stuff for me. <laughs> it's getting really dark. <laughs> oh, man, I wish I could pick up that lamp there. That'd be pretty cool. But, yeah, this is, uh, you know, the atmosphere of this place is just insane. You're just right on the edge of my seat here. Just have no idea what I might come across <laughs> over that corner. Yeah, it's just very exciting, very suspenseful gameplay. Just really, really fun. All right, so it looks like I got some more darts. I'm just kind of searching around. Sometimes uh, your characters will find things. Now, my other party has a ranger. And the cool thing about a ranger is they just automatically search. So you don't even have to have the search on. You'd just be walking around normally, and she would just find stuff all the time. So I think that's a pretty good... That alone would be enough reason for me to put a ranger in the party. Not to mention they're really kick-ass with bows. I see something. You know, this game was published in 2001, and a lot of games published around that time, they're just not very playable today. You know, the interface doesn't age very well. It's not just the graphics. You know, it's just stuff like the way you move around can be real cumbersome. Unfortunately, this game, you know, there's a little bit of a learning curve, but you're basically just moving around with mouse look and clicking the mouse. It doesn't let you do the WASD, but you could probably figure out how to do that somehow if you really wanted to. I'm actually okay with just using the mouse. Uh, you can tell some of the stuff, they just didn't have enough room on the screen to put it, so you had to kind of just mouse Reload. over it. You know, I'd love to see a HD remake of this game. <laughs> that would just be totally uh, amazing because they'd finally have enough room on the screen to get all that information on oh, there. Look there. Wait, consider it's 2001. They did a hell of a job. All right, found a spell book. So I can give that to my, my bishop here, and he can learn a new spell. By. Just uh, click Use. Splendid. So he's got a stamina spell now. Picked up some water spell points. You know, to me, this game is kind of a combination of, oh, one of those uh, Elder Scrolls games, maybe something earlier like Daggerfall, with a nice slice of uh, Might and Magic 7 thrown in. So it's kind of the best of those games put together. I, kill them all. <laughs> I just love these characters, you know? You don't... I was playing, believe it or not, Skyrim the other day, and... It just feels so lonely when you're ro ro roaming around that countryside. Even if you have a henchman, you hardly ever talk. There's just no personality to it. You take an older game like this, and these characters are always chatting and commenting on things, and you're chuckling with them, and you know, they get all excited when they find treasure and so on. It's, it just really adds to the enjoyment. And, uh, it makes you feel like you were playing with some good friends, good old uh, tabletop role-playing games. You'll notice I haven't tried to camp out inside this dungeon. Uh, if you do that, you will probably will die. <laughs> the game uh, actually is quite intelligent about where you can rest. So you see I found this little cell oh, here where a guy it. has passed away. Apparently he was being held prisoner here. But a little room like this, if I shut the door, I can rest in here without having to worry about getting interrupted. Go ahead and take that note here just in case it might be part of a, a quest later. Ah, got me some leather boots. Let me see who needs those the, the most. So you notice it didn't actually raise my average AC when I put those on. But uh, it will help protect the feet. If you, if you put the combat mode on verbose, verbose? <laughs> actually, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, but anyway, if you put it on the verbose feature, 
Now, then we'll actually tell you where the monsters are hitting. It actually factors in what part of the body they hit, so you can reduce damage. Now, I found a ring, but unfortunately, it's a bit of a bear to get things identified in the early part of the game. Even if you have uh, the identify spell, it fizzles a lot. You have all these different schools of magic, and if you know you can't raise them all, so you know if you have a really low, I think that's the part of the mental tree. So if you don't have that pumped up enough, you just keep fizzling your spells, messing them up, and sometimes the spells will actually backfire. So you have to be careful with that little power selector that pops up when you cast a spell. If you try to get carried away and uh, cast it too powerfully, <laughs> you might actually damage your own characters. <laughs> actually. Wipe my party a few times like that, putting everybody to sleep or uh, just doing outright damage. Okay, let's uh, skip forward a bit. I'll show you the first little mini boss here and then I'll show you my other party. Now, I should say a special shout out to Rid Cully, a friend of mine on Steam that gifted me the game along with the sixth and seventh ones. But one of the things he was worried about was the, you know, the game, the monsters in the game will scale up in difficulty with your party. I guess so you'll never just be, uh, you know, walking through here and slaughtering little level 1 rats when you're level 10 or whatever. You know, something like that, it turns some people off. They kind of like to be able just to roam through a low-level dungeon and kill everything. And I suppose they did that to keep things fresher, recycle the content a little better, because you do need to come back to this monastery later on. I don't really know how I feel about it, to be honest. I guess uh, I could take it or leave it. Another problem with the game is, uh, as we'll see, if these groups get too big, sometimes you'll be waiting quite a while for all the different monsters to get into place. Uh, fortunately, you can speed the combat up quite a bit. Pretty sure that in my settings here, I've got the combat speed up all the way. It would be a little nicer if I could at least double it. <laughs> so, any guys uh, working on a remake, that'd be something to take into consideration. And I'll show you how the lock picking works in the game. There's Quite a lot of stuff for a rogue-like character to do. Got a lock on it. My gadgeteer has a bit of a lock-picking ability, so does the bard. So I just basically have to keep doing this over and over until it locks. I guess if my, uh, or unlocks rather, I guess if my skill was higher that would work a little better. A lot of the guides I saw actually advised against having a dedicated rogue in the party. Apparently they don't think they carry their weight I think one thing, though, it's nice to have all those points put into your uh, lock picking. Also, there'll be tra trapped uh, treasure chests. The rogue's pretty good at unlocking those or disarming the traps. Actually, a pretty fun little sequence where you can disarm traps. But anyway, let's move on to that first mini boss. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> There's only two tumblers, and it's already taken me quite a while with these guys. So just imagine if. You know, what was that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine possible tumblers that could be there? Yeah, that would take a while. I was able to use my knock knock magic wand. That helped. Okay, there we go. This is the king crab, and he's a real badass crab. I don't know what the hell he's doing so far away from water, but uh, I guess we won't think too hard about that. Try to hit him with everything I got. Go ahead and get some heal wounds going. Looks like this guy gets multiple attacks. You can see my samurai. Almost dead already. Gotta keep the heals up, and if that doesn't work, you gotta get the get the uh, potion in the queue. You can try to terrorize him. Maybe that'll make him run away. Now I need to try to use an item. That heal potion. Ah, oh, good. So you can see somebody's knocked this crab unconscious somehow. So that's probably going to be the deciding factor in this battle. It can't defend itself. I can just do maximum damage. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. This crab killed me a bunch of times before, so this is real satisfaction. We win. It was a nasty. I don't know. <laughs> you guys are pretty cool. You see all those skills that increase after every battle? That's pretty cool. So, you know, if you have, uh, you might be out of fire spells, but go ahead and cast all your earth spells, water spells, air spells, you know. You can be building those up as well. Not sure, got some dynamite. 
can throw that at enemies later on. That's quite effective. All right, let me show you my other party. These guys have made it to the next segment of the game, a little town. And you'll see there's, uh, instead of being just straight up fantasy, there's a lot of science fiction mixed in with this. That sort of spaceship down there, and you got all these computers up here. Again, if you remember those Might and Magic games or some of the Ultima games, it do a similar sort of thing. You got a sort of the fantasy to start off with, and then you get to a modern or science fiction futuristic type scenario. So we're trying to figure out, I guess, why our ship crashed and what's going on with the, uh, oh, what's his name, the dark, dark savant. <laughs> you know, what's, what's he up to on this planet? Where is he? So it's a lot of, uh, you know, it tease, this game's really good at teasing you with things. There's a lot of areas that you can see, but you can't get into yet. A lot of machines that obviously you need to put something, some kind of part in there that you don't have yet. So and actually quite a few, what I would call adventure game elements. So I've got a flight yes. recorder that I need to put into a computer. Go ahead and heal up. Cause you never know what might be waiting for me here. Just because you clear an area out before it doesn't mean there's not going to be anything in it when you go back. So be careful with that. So I just need to find the... Yeah, there we go. Just flight recorder put my flight recorder in there, and then that'll give me a clue. But I'll go ahead and skip that because I <laughs> don't want to spoil it for you. You can pick up the two NPCs and join your party. Go ahead and show you my favorite, Vi. Finally! Oh, thank God it's you, uh, whoever you are. I was expecting the Dark Savant. And no offense, but you look like a bunch of schoolgirls compared to him. Hey! His troopers locked me up in here, and I was expecting him any minute. And we've already had one run in too many. Say, let's get out of here before he comes looking for me. We can tell Vi comes from the school of fashion over function when it comes to armor. But you can call me <laughs> What the hell? Yeah, I guess our nipples are fully protected. All else is open to the blade. I don't even know why you bother with shoulder pads. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I like the eyepiece she's got, though. It's very, very cool. Sort of a cyborg. She's a Valkyrie. So you can pick up pretty early in the game a Valkyrie and a thief, or a rogue NPC. So that, you know, if you're trying to decide how to build your party, you might factor that in. As you can see, the NPCs have quite a bit of dialogue, so they add quite a bit to the story. I'm going to go ahead and level up some characters, and I'll show you a battle with these guys. So one nice thing about this town here, and I guess uh, different places in the game, and there are actually people that will fight with you, allies, little green dots on the map. So as you'll see in this battle, some of the uh, town guards will come over and help me with these savant guards. This is actually some of the strategy guides I was looking at. Uh, people will kind of follow those guards around so that these battles here aren't quite as tough. You can see them coming in there. You'll also see how I tried to back myself into a corner so the mobs uh, can't surround me. It's the last thing you want is them attacking your backside. You need to get, like, double damage if they're attacking you from the rear. Oh, here they come. Fortunately, these guys look a lot worse than they are. Actually, kind of easy. See, they only got about 40 hit points. I just to get to this town, though, I was fighting these uh, raiders that had about 60, 70 hit points. <laughs> they were a hell of a lot tougher than these guys. I don't know what they were thinking with that. I guess maybe you're supposed to just try to avoid combat on the way over here. Yeah, so you can see the value of these spellcasters. Also, don't forget about your cherry bombs and rocket packs, dynamites, dynamites, <laughs> dynamite packs, sticks, uh, whatever you want to call them. You do a lot of damage that way. And, you know, you, you find enough of them, to, you don't really have to conserve them that much. You know, the trouble with me and stuff like that is if you give me health potions, I'll just hold on to that health potion forever. Afraid to use it because I'm always thinking that I'm going to need it eventually. But you just kind of have to get out of that habit, especially in a game with this level of difficulty. Just go ahead and use the potions. Use all your <laughs> explosive explosive devices and whatnot. Uh, hopefully you'll find some more, and it can be sometimes the only way you can get past some of these battles. 
love the way these things explode. So I got him webbed up. I don't think he's going anywhere. Go ahead and energy blast him. 10 points of damage. Let's see what else I can do here. Try to paralyze. You can paralyze him. That's really nice. You can also try to make him run away from you, but you know, it's not quite as good because uh, <laughs> you know, at least my ranged attacks aren't as strong as my melee. Plus, I can drag a battle out. So you see those uh, guards there hitting him from behind, doing lots of extra damage. So it pretty much made this battle, which would have been extremely difficult, pretty much a cakewalk. I gotta say, it's been a long time since I've enjoyed a computer role-playing game as much as this one. And like I said, I missed it back in the day, and I'm really glad I finally got around to playing it. It's really fun, and it holds up well. I mean, you could uh, complain about a few things. Uh, some of the bigger battles with multiple groups do tend to drag on, but I think you'll be willing to overlook that. Uh, you can get this on Steam, or I'd recommend GOG. I'll post a link to it on the show notes so you can support Matt Chat at the same time. So. I will say one more thing uh, that I wanted to make sure to mention. Uh, you notice how I've got it in the letterbox mode with those black bars on the side? Uh, just by default, it seems like the game stretches, uh, which makes it look like crap. So you might want to do like I did and go into your graphics card settings and make sure you're not scaling it automatically. Ideally, it should look like this with the black bars, at least until we get that widescreen version that I'm hoping for. Anyway, I'll leave it here, guys, and I uh, hope you enjoy Wizardry 8. So, you said you were leaving for a week. What's it been? Seven years, Helly. Seven long years. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a brand new interview series with Seth Robinson, the designer of the Legend of the Red Dragon, one of the best BBS door games. I don't know if you even know what a BBS door game is, but I guarantee you really like this interview. He also did a Dink Smallwood, in case you don't recognize Lord, but suffice it to say you want to be around, don't miss it. As always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much if you have supported this show. really means a lot to me, guys. If you want to support Matt Chat, just go to mattchat.us and look for the Support the Show link. Uh, you can make a donation or set up a, a, a subscription of any size, guys. I don't think that any amount is too small. I really, really appreciate everything. Thank you very much. Now, what about that ale of the week? Well, ah, funny you should ask. Uh, this week I've got a Fresh Hop India Pale Ale, Hop Kitchen, brewed by the New Belgium Brewing Company out of Fort Collins, Colorado. And apparently this is made with salmon safe hops. Salmon safe <laughs> hops. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure what uh, ordinary hops, how that manages uh, to endanger salmon. Fresh, aromatic, and green as a leprechaun skivvies. <laughs> Certified Salmon Safe Oregon hops are picked fresh off the vine and trucked directly to our brew kettle. Okay, so I guess that's all the information I'm getting. Uh, let's see, alcohol 7% by volume, so uh, definitely not too bad. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Fresh Hops uh, Salmon Safe IPA here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I been smelling this. You can definitely smell the salmon. <laughs> Actually, I kid you not, I do detect a little bit of a salmon. Like aroma to this, a little bit of a fishy smell. I don't know if that's just my imagination. Probably, but uh, you never really know. Uh, I guess they were uh, safe all the way to the brew kettle. Yeah, in all seriousness, though, you can definitely smell a lot of hoppiness in there. It's very uh, crisp. I'm, I'm going to guess this will be rather bitter, as uh, would suit a good IPA. Anyway, let's give it a taste. Mm. Uh, so this one's, um, <clears throat> it's not as bitter as I thought. Actually kind of a, a sort of a little citrusy, although well, there comes the bitterness. Uh, so it takes a while for the uh, bitterness to kick in on this. Uh, you definitely get that strong hoppy flavor. A little bit of a, you know, it's kind of high up in the, in the palate here. It's definitely not sort of heavy like a lot of these IPAs can get. Anyway, let me give it another taste here. Yeah.
yeah, not bad. You get sort of a lemony I like flavor to it, a little bit of a citrusy, sort of a effervescent like quality to this. It's a very light, um, with a good you know good amount of flavor to it. I'm not going to say I'm in love with this one, uh, but there's definitely a lot of stuff going on here. It's sophisticated. It's complex. It's a salmon safe, so you know how can you go wrong? I'll give it one more taste. <laughs> Yeah, all in all, not bad. I'd be happy to, uh, you know, drink uh, several of these. I think you would too. I'm gonna go uh, four out of five uh, drinking horns on this. You know, it's not fantastic, but it's definitely very, very nice, and it's uh, very pleasant to drink and something to try if you haven't tried a lot of IPAs. Maybe you're looking for an IPA that's not quite as bitter as uh, they tend to be. Uh, this would be a good choice for you. Anyway, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, for the quotation uh, for the quotation this week, I found one from Groucho Marx, uh, one of my favorite comedians. It goes something like this: Any man who tells you he can see through women is missing a lot. See you guys next week. Now, uh, now you tell me what you know. One of them goes around with a black mustache. So do I. If I had my choice, I'd go around with a little blonde.